Okay, uh, environmental methodologists, Envi in whatever environmental me methodologists. Uh, so um, we have already discussed critical thinking, and now it's time to turn to science. Uh, in advance, I got to warn you, it's kind of a long lecture. Uh, I hope that you take uh, breaks, maybe two breaks during the source of this lecture. Uh, during the course of this lecture, uh, it's a good idea not to sit in one place listening to this kind of stuff for more than 15 or 20 minutes. So I'll try to remind you, but if I don't, do it yourself. You have the power. Okay, um, learning objectives of this presentation. I want to just define the term science and then distinguish science from technology. They're often conflated by people. Um, understand the assumptions behind the scientific method uh, and know the basic steps in the scientific method. This is the boring part that everybody already knows. Um, then what happens after the experiment is completed? The scientific method is really describes a method for doing experiments. And so, hey, uh, scientists don't stop there. Stuff happens afterward. What is that? Uh, then I want to talk in maybe more depth than people are used to about the social context of science. I want to talk about peer review, publication, publicity, and competition for research funds. And then uh, critically evaluating scientific literature. Hey, we started out with critical thinking. Why don't we apply critical thinking to scientific literature? Okay, so let's do it. Science, two definitions, not just one. It means two completely, well, two different things. The first, it's a systematic method for learning about the world and testing our understanding of it. Okay, so it's systematic. It's got a system to it. First do one, then do two, then do three. Um, and also it's, um, it's also a way of testing stuff, testing hypotheses. And we'll talk more about hypothesis testing when we come to statistics because that's what scientists do to test hypotheses. They measure things, they get numbers, and then they use statistics to deal with those numbers. Some of you are nervous about the statistics part of this class. Please don't be nervous. I'm going to presume you uh, remember almost nothing from your former traumatic uh, um, um, statistics class and I am going to help you through it. I'm going to give you just a user's guide to using statistics so you can actually use it. Anyway, uh, also science is not just a systematic method, it's also a body of the, a body of knowledge itself of the type that can be rationally explained and reliably applied. In other words, so science is a method, it's a method of getting information and then it's that information itself after it's been acquired from the scientific method. So when people say, oh, the science of vaccinations is well known, they're talking about the body of knowledge. When someone says, let's do some science to figure out this new virus, um, they're talking about applying the sy systematic method. Okay, so make sure it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward, two different definitions, make sure you know what they are. Uh, here's the classic, uh, uh, analogy for what, or metaphor for what, uh, uh, the second definition for the body of knowledge. Science is a huge body of knowledge and it builds upon itself. So someone discovers one thing and then the next person uses that information to do more tests and discover more things and that builds up over time. It's actually a pretty useful metaphor, I think. Uh, and sometimes what happens is uh, we think there's a solid foundation in some aspect of, of science and then some smarty pants upstairs says, hey, wait a minute, we went back and we uh, found out something that, that calls into question our whole foundation over here. And um, usually that's ignored until they get even more information. And then that all crumbles away and there's this big like earthquake in the pyramid. And I will talk about uh, paradigm shifts later on in this lecture. Nevertheless, it seems as of 2020 that this body of scientific knowledge works pretty good. If it didn't, we wouldn't be uh, talking virtually right now because this science has married technology and developed computers and stuff, the internet. Okay, so let's understand the difference between science and technology since I just raised that. First, science already defined it. So what's technology? Technology, please memorize the definition are the tools and techniques used to solve a problem. So technology is all about tools and techniques. Okay, great. 
don't conflate these two things. Okay, but they're related because they serve each other. Science sometimes serves technology. How, can you think of an example where science uh, helped develop technology? Well, I can think of many. Um, for instance, let's see. Oh, um, learning about radioisotopes uh, helped understand radioactivity and uh, that allowed us to develop super accurate clocks because I think those clocks are based on radioactive decay, the really, really good ones. And um, uh, now because we have such super accurate clocks, that enables us to have GPS. So did you know that the GPS in your car ultimately depends upon some radioisotope clock somewhere in a satellite? And uh, so anyway, so science helped develop that technology of GPS. What about the other way around? Technology sometimes serves science. How? Well, just the first, see if you can think of some examples. Maybe pause the video. Don't just sit there passively. Pause it and think. Okay, I'll give you some examples. Uh, well, let's see. Having uh, the G, uh, geospatial technology available helps us test hypotheses on, for instance, animal movement or um, fire uh, susceptibility of different forests, uh, before and after uh, uh, fire events, all kinds of things where um, a new technological gizmo gives us new tools where we can address problems we haven't been able to address before. The development of the, of the microscope, for example, that's pure technology. Once you got the microscope, you can do all kinds of cool science. Okay, so they're overlapping words, but they're different. So make sure you got that straight. All right, how is science used? Um, two most basic categories of how science is used. First, simple curiosity. How does the world work? And, and just, I'll reveal my bias. I love that. Just the idea of going out into nature, not doing it for any purpose except for pure curiosity. And actually in my, um, my uh, graduate work, I was lucky enough to be able to do that. I had a very indulgent major advisor who let me dream up my own hypothesis, develop my own experiments, and do my own stuff. And I chose something completely unrelated to anything to do with human or human benefit. I was just super curious about that area. I'm sure my advisors rolled their eyes at me, but you know, a lot of really interesting things have come from people just poking around and asking questions that nobody else would do. Uh, I'm not going to give you examples, I'm sure you can find them. Uh, but the second category of how science used is to develop something useful. Now, if you can develop something useful, that gets into the area of society and benefit to society, yes. Also maybe money, maybe making money from someone, and so therefore they'll pay you to do your work, and there's quid pro quo. Um, Definitely developing things useful is beneficial to humanity and you can think of gazillions of things that were useful to humanity. I mentioned earlier uh, dentistry uh, and uh, Novocaine, pain killing stuff, that's useful. The internet, I suppose the internet is useful. Some of us uh, are curmudgeons and sometimes we wonder about technology. But anyway, um, the shoes on your feet, the medicines you take, the glasses you have to help your eyes, all, all these things are useful. And so a lot of science is used to, for, to, to develop things useful. And of course, industry, they want to do things better. They want to have the edge on their competition. They want to provide products that people really want when they can find a human need and they can, they can use science to figure out how to do it. They will make more money, be more profitable, employ more people, and everyone will be happier, right? Anyway, okay, just some examples. Oh, I do have examples. Antibiotics develop something useful. A better tablet display, something useful. How about blowing up your neighbor? That could be very useful, especially if they're working on the same sort of thing to blow you up first. Oh, arms races. Science very handy when you're in an arms race. Uh, I bring this up because um, I am certain that military has been a big driver of science, and it's sad, but true. Okay, hey, guess what? There are some assumptions built into the scientific method. The first assumption, assumption, unproven assertions and assumption that the universe works 
according to unchanging natural law. Okay, uh, what are those laws? I, I think the physicists are working on them. I think they're trying to get one unified theory of everything. But basically, uh, there are dimensions, like point, line, space, volume, and time, four dimensions. Um, there's, I don't know, the, the law of gravity, um, the, the f forces that interact, uh, I'm, I'm really stretching here, on the subatomic level. Um, those are natural laws that are unchanging. They do not change. They've been around since the Big Bang, since the universe suddenly came into existence. They're, they're um, happening now, and they're going to happen until eternity, until the universe ends. That's an assumption, right? Now, if it, it's held up pretty well, um, we haven't been able to reject these assumptions. They've enabled us to do crazy things like land rockets in precise places on a different planet uh, and so forth. But still, it's possible that these things actually do change sometime, but we don't know about it. Okay, but anyway, it's an assumption. I'm just trying to just lay these out for your critical analysis. Number two, events arise from causes and they cause other events. In other words, the whole universe uh, relies, can be explained by cause and events. Things don't just happen. Even spontaneous mutation, if you know anything about biology and DNA, uh, there is this thing called mutation and it's spontaneous, but actually it doesn't just happen. There's explanations for why mutations happen. It's because of, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, x-rays or whatever um, that are damaging, they're ionizing radiation, causes changes in base pairs. That's a mutation. Um, and so I'm sure there's a whole science behind how mutations happen. So mutations don't just happen. There's a certain randomness to them, and, uh, but there's a cause. Okay, so that's two assumptions. The third is that we humans can understand natural processes by using our senses and our reasons, like our eyes, our ears, our nose. We can experience stuff, we can reason about it, and we can use these things to understand natural processes. That sounds pretty common sense, right? But it's conceivable that we're not able to understand all natural processes. It's possible that we're limited by our senses and even our ability to develop machines that sense things. Uh, maybe they're limited too. There could be other natural things going on there that we just can't know about. But it seems like we can and we're assuming we can understand everything given these human bodies. Okay. Hopefully none of those like, seem completely wrong to you. They don't seem wrong to other scientists uh, who mostly don't even think about these. We just, this is the water we, we swim in. We never really question these things. But I, now I'm just gonna go off in a little Murphyism. You won't find other scientists saying this, but I'm just gonna share it with you. I will contend that belief in these premises, because these are premises, if these work, then we can do science. Um, and belief in these premises is a form of faith. And thus, even science is a faith-based way of thinking. That is um, blasphemy to many scientists to say that science is faith-based. No, it's science-based. Science is science-based. Uh, I think you drank your own Kool-Aid there, Buster. But uh, it's just, um, I think it's I always try to practice critical thinking, especially when I'm teaching a course that has critical thinking in it. And so one should also be open to um, other explanations, uh, ideas that are different from one's own. And one should always examine and analyze everything. So this is my analysis of the assumptions of the scientific method. And I come to this conclusion, you're welcome to disagree with me. I'm not gonna require you to believe what I believe in. I'm just putting it out there for you. Okay. Uh, but yeah, there are three assumptions, so make sure you know what those are, okay? I do want you to know what those are. Next one. Okay, so given all that, are there, is there anything that science can't explain? Um, yes, there is. There are some things that are outside the scope of science. For instance, anything outside of the physical universe. So I don't know what's out there because what I know is based upon science. And science can't, by definition, uh, um, observe anything outside the physical universe. That's all science can, can see, can, can address. 
So if there's stuff outside the uni physical universe, like God, um, that's outside the scope of science. Science will never tell you what God is, or gods, or the soul. Uh, there was, I think, some attempt to weigh uh, someone who is dying and see if there's a change in their weight at the moment of death. I think this happened like in the 17th century, 18th century, and they saw a change in weight of one person after they died. Do you think that's good science? I don't know. Uh, there was a long time that people thought, well, like anatomists, early anatomists were like, I wonder where the soul resides. Someplace in here must be the soul. Um, I, it's, as far as I know, uh, so people are concluding that the soul uh, does not have any mass or measurable energy, that it exists outside the scope of science. So great, we can have souls, but we can't study them using science yet. <clears throat> string theory. I don't know what string theory is. Uh, it seems to uh, posit multiple dimensions above the four we're familiar with kind of outside if it's part of the physical universe maybe we could study it if we were capable of it but maybe we're not capable of doing it because of our um our physical limitations um but and nevertheless there are people who study string theory i don't know how they're doing i hope they're doing good because it sounds interesting to me Oh, aesthetics. So anything outside the physical universe is one category of the outside the scope of science. Also, aesthetics. Uh, I, I like classical music. You like hip hop. Uh, is, can we apply science to that? Uh, I, I used to say no. Now we're getting so smart on uh, neural, neural chemistry and understanding how the brain works that and plus you know the effect of society on our development etc so maybe aesthetics could be subjected to science i'd be sad if that were true but i'm for now i'll say it's outside the scope of science morality questions of good and bad um good good and unless good means uh m fewer deaths and more births or something quantitative and measuring not like um, I don't know, abortion. Is abortion right or wrong? That is outside the scope of science. Is it right or wrong to kill a person? Um, that, that's a question of morality. I don't think you can uh, um, reduce that to science. It's more complicated than that. But a lot of things are inside the scope of science. I just wanted to make sure you also knew there's some other areas that are uh, off base. Okay. So um, what is this thing you call the scientific method? I've referred to it periodically uh, in this lecture, and I'm just going to sort of breeze over these. I Actually, I'm not going to breeze over them because I, on the one hand, I feel like most of my students know this stuff already. On the other hand, maybe you don't. And so I'm just going to do it. Um, if you've heard this 15 times, please bear with me, be patient, or fast forward or whatever. Um, but if, you, if you're not really clear on the scientific method, make sure you know this. So the first part is to uh, observe the world, ask a question, and consider possible answers. You notice that in wintertime when it frosts outside, like frost forms in some areas, but not otherwise. Like, why is that? You're like, why? You look, and, and we're actually going to want you to do that. Oh, no, that's a different class. Um, <laughs> uh, so just, you know, uh, golly gee, people are dying all of a sudden because of uh, uh, pneumonia and clusters are in this one city. I wonder why that is. Uh, time to pull out the scientific method and develop a testable hypothesis. Well, we've ruled out it's everything we know must be something new. It could be a bacterium. It could be a virus. It could be an environmental thing. It could be genetics. It could be random. You need to test all these hypotheses. Each one of those would be a different hypothesis. Then, number three, develop, a, develop an experiment. Now, the nature of this experiment, it's got some rules in it. I'm going to go over some of those rules in quite detail in a second. Right now, I'm just going to say develop a replicable experiment to test the hypothesis. By replicable, it means somebody else could do the exact same thing you did. Because presumably, if they do the exact same thing you did, they're gonna get the same result. So um, that's important. That Otherwise, if you do an experiment, you don't tell anybody how you did it, how would they know you did it right? Okay, 
Then, number four, perform the experiment, gather the data in an unbiased manner. There's that word again, unbiased manner. You know, if you think, I want to test whether this thing is caused by viruses or not, would you just look for viruses? Or would you also look for bacteria? Because maybe bacteria did it. If you only look for viruses, that's biased, okay? So you want to, um, anyway, perform the experiment, gather data, do it. And then number five, in, after you're done doing all the experimentation, you've got notebooks full of data or files in your computers, analyze that data and then form conclusions. So you want, but there's so much wrapped up in this, analyze the data, gather it, crunch it, clean it up. If it's, it's error strewn with errors, clean it up, um, calculate mean standard deviation, do statistical testing, make charts that show things, do correlation analysis, whatever. Analyze the data. After you do that, form conclusions about the hypothesis. What was the hypothesis? Number two, okay, do my data support the hypothesis or don't they? Make a conclusion. Uh-huh, it's a virus and suggest future work. Is it a coronavirus or a norovirus or some other kind of virus? Okay, so that's a lot wrapped up in all these numbers. Well, you're not done. You still have to communicate to other people. So you have to publish it so people know what you discovered. Okay, that's six steps. Please be sure you could actually write down each one of these six steps. So I write down four of them and you write it in the other two. Okay, it is a method and uh, we've been using this for about 400 years and it works pretty good and it guides our society in tremendously powerful ways. You should know what it is. Okay. Now, I have some comments about this thing called the experiment. To uh, perform an experiment, or no, develop a replicable, uh, replicable experiment, number three. This is a good time for a break because the next part's complicated. It's been 22 minutes. Maybe you should take a break. So take a break. All right, I'm going to continue. Some comments on scientific experiments. Okay, first of all, they must have a no and alternate hypotheses. I'm going to say this now. I'm going to say it again when we talk about statistics. You need to know this. The no hypothesis, did I say this? Yes is a statement of no effect, of no difference. In the virus example, it would be, these people are not getting sick by viruses, okay? I think they're getting sick because of viruses. That's what I hope for. That's what I want to, dis that's what I want to discover, my bias. So my no is the opposite of kind of what I want. All right, I say, um, I think that um, if we burn these forests frequently, we'll have a lot more straight, straight hazelnut uh, stems here. Um, I say that because basketry weaving is super important to some of the Northwestern indigenous groups. And um, I'm sure that some of the, one of the purposes of frequent burning of forests by indigenous people was to promote uh, growth of good basketry material, including hazelnut. So. I'm a scientist, Western scientist. I'm like, oh, yeah, indigenous people have thousands of years of knowledge on this stuff, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ignore and discount it. I'm just going to subject it to a scientific method. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to have multiple forests and I'm going to burn some and I'm going to not burn some. or I'm going to burn them on a different frequency and then I'm going to measure, make some kind of measurement of hazelnut stems. My null hypothesis would be not what I expect to find, which is more uh, um, straighter hazelnut stems in the frequently burned forest, but instead, no matter what I do, it's going to have no effect. A no means no, no effect. All right, I'm saying this because, man, students get it wrong. So don't get it wrong. All right, so uh, the null, uh, the experiment must be designed to disprove the null hypothesis. So your whole goal in science, you want to find significance. The way you do it is to disprove the no. Okay, it's not to prove anything. You don't, I don't know why, don't ask me why, but it's, it's impossible. In science, we don't try to prove anything. The only tool we have in our toolbox is to disprove stuff. These two things can't be simultaneously true, so we reject them. Um, so usually we're left with, well, 
we disproved the null hypothesis, so we're going to conclude that burning forests um, increase in this method or at this frequency, uh, you know, has that effect on hazelnuts. That's how it works. It's a little bit counterintuitive, so make sure you study it, make sure you understand it, and commit it to memory. All right, and this is an example of a core value of the scientific method, SM, scientific method. It's skepticism, right? It's part of critical thinking. It's like never believing anything utterly, but instead questioning and asking why. We try to disprove every null hypothesis via critical thinking. Well, if this, then that. And if not that, then fit or something like that. <laughs> anyway, use critical thinking. All right. Experiments must be designed to avoid all bias. So probably you know what that means. Um, and for instance, maybe you've heard of placebo, the placebo effect. It turns out that if you're sick with something and I give you a pill that says this pill is going to make you better. And I also have a position of authority to you and you believe in me. When I give you that pill, I say you must take this pill three times a day for five days and then you'll get better. It turns out that that has an effect even if that pill is got is nothing. It's nothing pill. Uh, and so it turns out that humans are really complicated and our beliefs and expectations actually affect us in, in surprising ways. And so um, to the if I am trying to demonstrate whether this new compound I have, uh, like, I don't know, derived from willow that like it's acetyl salicylic acid. I know that people have used willow to treat headaches for a, for a long time, but I've isolated this white powder from it. And I think that this is the stuff that's helping. And um, if I just give a bunch of people with headaches that pill, they're gonna have a better outcome than, uh, let's see, if I, if I um, just, let's see, if I just give them the pill, and compare them to a bunch of people who didn't take a pill, even if my pill was made of sugar, those people would have would report fewer headaches. That's the placebo effect. So anyway, in this example, in medical research, what you do is you get different groups of people. Some don't get anything. Some get a placebo and some get the, um, the real deal. And then you compare the differences among these, these three groups. That's one example of um, avoiding bias. There's so many different kinds of bias though, and we're going to be discussing different types of bias. And uh, so I'm gonna sort of skip over this briefly. I, I just deal with this briefly right now and skip over a lot of it. Um, what happens is when you go to publish your paper, your peers, uh, professionals who are in the same area as you are, you don't know who they are, um, they look over your work and they're gonna look very carefully for any evidence of bias because bias contaminates your results, makes your results unacceptable. If there's bias in an experiment, unless it's stated up front, we did it this way and we understand it's bias, but we had reasons to do it this way. Um, if there's implicit bias in anything you do, boom, it's contaminated, it's not, it's not worthy of publication. So scientists go to great lengths to avoid all bias. Must be replicable, I talked about that already. Uh, and the results must be analyzed with perfect logic <laughs> because if they're not, the peer reviewers or anyone else who reads it later on is gonna look at that and go, what is this shit? And, um, and throw it in the garbage can. So uh, boy, that's a team effort to make sure you have really good logic and reasonable, that your experiment is reasonable. Also, your work must be placed in the context of all the science that preceded it. We're doing this experiment on headaches because Headache is a real problem in society. Look what Smith and Jones said. Um, they said, bah, so much less productivity with people with headaches. Um, we uh, understand that willow bark uh, extracts have been very powerful in reducing pain. Look at the studies over here by so-and-so, their study. Okay, so there's this whole framework that we're in um, that leads to this particular question and why these scientists have this hypothesis and have developed this experiment. So that's what I mean by putting in the context of all the science that has preceded it. And that's where you get the literature cited at the end. You have all these references at the end of all these papers. That is the context in which this experiment was performed. 
It's the, the, all the bricks uh, of the pyramid that undergirds your work. The complete work must be peer reviewed before it's acceptable for publication. Anonymous peer review. This is anonymous. And I think I've explained why uh, if I get a paper written by you and you're a powerful person, I'm going to hesitate to piss you off by rejecting your paper or to critique it, uh, to say anything bad about it, because you might retaliate. Um, so, I, but on the other hand, there is actually some bias in this because the people doing the review know the writers. I don't think they withhold the, uh, the author's names. So uh, I might say, ah, this up and coming whippersnapper who's uh, challenging my work, I'm going to um, give them a bad review because I just don't like them. That's possible, I suppose. The editor of the journal, though, um, should be thinking about this and looking at it and, and is a, sort of an intermediary between the peer reviewers and the person writing the stuff. Okay. And lastly, the complete work must be published or it does not become part of science, of the second definition, the, that pyramid metaphor. Okay. Wordy, wordy slide. Very sorry. I wouldn't have done it if I didn't think it was important. So please study it carefully. Okay. However, oh darn, not all science comes from experimentation and hypothesis testing. What? I thought it did. No, it doesn't. Um, there is experimental science and there's uh, experimental studies and there's observational studies, which simply gather data from natural sources. And here's some examples. Uh, well, I mentioned traditional ecological knowledge, for instance, the Wiat Yurok Hoopa and Karuk knowledge that controlled burning has many positive effects and the absence of burning leads to many negative ecological effects. So these folks probably were not using the exact scientific method that I'm describing before, but they were still observing the natural world and interacting with it and recording what they did, knowing what works and what doesn't, and passing that information down. It's very scientific-like, um, and that's, that, um, that is knowledge now that very slowly Western science is beginning to acknowledge as worthy and incorporating into this, this uh, more formal pyramid of Western science. Uh, Basically, knowledge of flora and fauna by humans since the dawn of time is observational study. Uh, uh, I, I guess like local knowledge. So um, if you go across the street to some old timer and, or their family or their grandma, their grandma, granddad, and they say, uh, they tell you, don't go fishing today. This is the wrong time to go fishing. Um, they don't know this by scientific method stuff. They know this from observational studies over long periods of time. Here's a, a, a bigger example. China has the longest unbroken record of astronomical observations of any culture in the world. They weren't following the six steps of, of the scientific method, but they were observing and recording, and this becomes part of our uh, pyramid of scientific knowledge. Uh, do I say anything? Uh, Charles Darwin. Well, he was wandering all over the world, and before he published anything, before he even really had developed the theory of, or his hypothesis of, of evolution. Um, but he, he traveled a lot. He got on a boat, the Beagle, and, and went around South America, went to the Galapagos, came back with huge amounts of collections, just direct observation of the natural world. Okay, just showing, throwing this slide at you again. Make sure you understand these two things. You know a lot more about the method. You know more about the body of knowledge itself. You also know that not all of the bricks in this pyramid were derived from experimentation. A lot was done from just uh, natural observation. Okay, science, two definitions. Another good time for a break. We're at 34 minutes. Here's some good terms for you to know. Empirical. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, academics will sound fancy. They say empirically. That's not true. You're like uh, empirically. Uh, it's happened to me many times. Empirical means based on observation rather than theory. And when I learned this word, I was like, I'm very happy to now have a word to apply to uh, my bias. 
I prefer um, direct observation rather than theory. So I have friends who really prefer theory. So we'll get together and talk about teaching and they'll talk about latest pedagogical theory and how students can't learn anything after sitting 10 minutes in front of a lecture. And so you should cut your lectures into short little 10 minute blocks. Um, and I'm like, yeah, I, I hear your theory, but really, how do you run your classes? I want to know exactly what you do, what doesn't work. And so I, I prefer to share stories with other faculty on what they do and why they do it and how they did it and, and how it worked. And that's empirical knowledge. That's my bias. Um, but now I have a word to describe it. Control. Tricky term because it's got two completely different meanings. First is it's a verb. I control a thing or I am controlling something, which means to manipulate or change a variables. For instance, she controlled temperature in her experiment by providing heat and monitored it with a thermometer. Okay, controlled it. I made it high, made it low. I, I didn't let it wander around randomly. Okay, that's the first definition of the word control. This, I conducted a controlled experiment. Uh, foof. Will, that will be more meaningful soon. The second definition is the word is a noun. An exper a, um, a control as a noun is an experimental group that's not exposed to some change. So my group that got the placebo is a control. My group that receives no medicine at all, no pill at all, placebo or not, is also a control. My group that got some of the medicine that I was hypothesizing doing something, that was my experimental group. So I have an experimental group and a control group. Okay, and there is my uh, example there. So uh, I'm actually hesitating now that I said this. I conducted a controlled experiment. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous that I'm saying this wrong, so don't worry about it, but I believe that when I say I conducted a controlled experiment, means it means I didn't do a natural experiment. In other words, I controlled all the variables or as many as I could in my experiments, and then I varied one of them. Um, so, uh, and then I measured something else. Uh, that person will also, in someone conducting a controlled experiment will also include a control group in their controlled experiment. And you can see why this is confusing, okay? Um, because I'm using the same word to describe two different things. So I might control all the variables and then let one vary and look for a response. And in that I might include a group that is not exposed to any manipulation at all. And that would be a control group. Okay, read that stuff over, listen to what I said over multiple times, see if you, um, uh, if, make sure you understand it and Google it if you remain confused. Okay, and the last is a natural experiment is an empirical study in which nature provides the control in experimental groups. So in my example of burning forests, if I wanna look at the effect of burning on um, um, hazelnut stems, then I would wanna include a forest that's unburned at all. So nature is then uh, providing me the control. Okay. Well, okay, this is a lot of stuff. I now want to talk about a larger process than just experimentation. What happens after the experiments? Well, here's just a, a diagram of the exper experimental method. Not going to go over it again. Um, and I covered it all, including up to the paper and peer review. But then some other stuff happens that's more, I don't know, social, I guess. I guess it's all social in a way, but it's rarely talked about. So here's the deal. Let's say you're a scientist on a team or alone, whatever, and you publish a paper, you want to publish a paper, you subject it to peer review, you mail it away to um, some, new, some journal. And when it comes back from the peers, it might be rejected, in which case you're very sad, like what, and mad, and then you go back to the drawing room and drawing board and you try to fix it if you think it can be salvaged, uh, which is sad because it's a whole lot of work getting to this point. So you can imagine that. What happens if it's accepted? Well, 
then it's published, and then people look at it, and then what? Well, uh, a lot could happen and should happen after that point that involves the scientists, and no one ever really talks about this, so I wanted to talk about it. Um, if you just, well, first of all, typically when a scientist publishes a paper, they also have an opportunity to promote it in a number of other ways. Uh, a common way is to go to an annual convention of your particular group, which happens with every single group of scientists out there. There's a mycology society, there's a botany society, there's multiple ecological societies, there's all kinds of different societies and people come to them and they talk and they socialize and they also um, give formal talks, you might present your paper as well as having published it. And so people can sit there and hear your summary of it and then they can ask you questions about it uh, afterwards or look you up um, afterwards or have a few drinks and talk about your work. Uh, uh, that you can have a poster session um, and those might become part of a, like a separate publication. Uh, you can go to the media, you can talk to the media. The media might say, whoa, that's really crazy that frog saliva can make beetles hallucinate. I just made that up. Um, and then if when it goes up, get it, when it escapes from your narrow cloistered discipline and into wider society and is interesting there, a lot can happen. You also, every publication that you have made becomes a record of your own, that's called productivity, the, the accomplishments of a scientist. And so as these get larger, you establish a record of being able to address and answer problems um, and ask interesting new questions and stay up with the times and make more provocative, have more provocative results and attract graduate students and attract money uh, and all sorts of things. And so these publications are super important. Um, also, once you've published something, someone else sees what you've published and they go, that's the most amazing thing. I was working on a, the same thing with um, amphibian saliva. And so now that I know that's true of frogs, where can we go with this? And so uh, um, you can often measure the success of a paper by how many times it's cited by other papers because people get excited by what you did and they want to build upon that. Okay, what I've just said, I don't know if it means anything to you. It Basically, I'm just trying to say that there's a lot of, I'm going to call this social activity that is not represented by a typical uh, depiction of a five or six step scientific method. There's a whole lot more that goes on in the world that is not depicted there. And I hope I've given you just a sense of what that, that's like. And say, gosh, yes, money counts. Um, so if you're a successful researcher and you publish things that gather attention, you often can translate that into getting money uh, into your lab. So you get grants and uh, get multiple grants. You use those grants well. The grants make a lot of publications. Maybe you patent some things based upon your grants. Makes it more likely that you'll get more grants after that. Okay. Um, or if you're in industry, you know, you have a research group that is coming up with cool new iPhones or whatever, a new screen display or sound or camera, they're going to pump more money back at that research group within the industry. So a lot of this stuff, that I'm sad to say because I'm like a purist about science and think it shouldn't be influenced by money at all. That's a naive point of view. Um, uh, science and money um, are like this. Okay, whoops. So, okay, so want to say some other considerations pre and post method. What I mean, some things to think about before you do the experiment, some things to think about after the experiment. So before you do any work, what is interesting? What is worth studying? Um, where is the funding coming from? Has anyone invented some cool new tools I can use to study my favorite organism, the nematode that I've been studying all my life? Um, so th it's like, uh, this also is not done in a vacuum by individuals all by themselves. Typically 
there are teams of researchers studying the same stuff. Boy, we all came together because we just love nematodes. I've been, you know, there's the nematode lab in Arkansas and the nematode lab in New York, and we've been working on it together for a long time. And our students go on and they study more nematodes. Um, they come up together with cool new things, ideas on what to study. Okay. Afterwards, um, are results publishable? What's the most prestigious news uh, journal I can get published in? Um, where can you? Where else can I present my results? Um, I could do it online. I forgot to mention that. I could have a blog. Um, I have a, a departmental web page. Um, the conventions. I could go to the press and the social media. How about within my institution? Um, I'm speaking mostly from academia here, not industry or commercial. Um, in academia, we have colleges and universities, and there's a, a promotion system that in a very important way depends on your productivity. What have you done lately? Have you uh, published anything lately? And if you have, that's great. And if you haven't, not so great. Um, are you doing what you need to be doing to get promoted? Not just publish papers, but also um, uh, assist with the community of your professionals, like because uh, that's a duty we have. Are you peer reviewing other things? Are you uh, getting grants in because the university takes a cut out of every grant? So they love it when their faculty get grants. Um, do you deserve or want more space or renovation um, or your own institute? There's, there's little fiefdoms within academia that are uh, ruled by faculty who have been very successful. By successful, they've published a lot, they've gotten a lot of money, and also they've been able to navigate university politics, both within a department or within a college or university-wide. And so um, I, I just mention this because I've seen so many funny things happen in academia over just space, office space, lab space, um, getting money to renovate it, um, opening up new institutions. There's a lot that goes on that has nothing to do with hypothesis testing. Um, here's just some considerations for a, a successful scientist. You work well as a team member. Uh, Usually productive, successful scientists do not work alone. They work as teams because nobody is that smart. Very few people are smart enough to do it on their own. It's really having good social skills as well as uh, you know a, a love for your profession and a dedication to doing the science. It's what it takes. Uh, do you attract graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, and other collaborators? And do they love you? Uh, and do they say good things about you? Um, are you an honest, trustworthy, supportive mentor, um, uh, both within your institution and outside your, your institution and your profession, even your country? Um, are you learning to manage complicated funding and administration challenges? Because as you, as you become successful, um, you end up getting, like managing a lot of money and people and far or less work on the experimentation itself. You end up having other people do that stuff for you. So that's something that uh, uh, successful researchers deal with over the course of their careers. Want to give you a little taste of that flavor. Okay. Ah, another good time. Oh, 48 minutes. Another good time for a break. I still got some more stuff. We ain't done yet. There's a quick and easy reading on Canvas about certainty and uncertainty in science. It should debunk the idea that there's uh, that we're after certainty and, and hopefully um, let you realize that uncertainty is what scientists are really uh, crazy about, really interested in. Okay, last thing I'm going to do is just bash on science. Good. Just give it the really old one-two. Uh, Got a picture here. This guy, he looks like a science guy, doesn't he? Why? He's wearing a uniform. What's that? Uni what's up with that uniform? Is it there to keep the chemicals from splashing on his shirt? Or is it there as a social badge that tells you, I'm a scientist, not one of those other people? I've also got a tie on. Why do I have a tie? It's a social construct. It's a message, a subtle, nonverbal message to you that I'm a scientist. Okay, can't avoid the elephant in the room. This particular scientist seems to be male and white. Okay, so that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? But there is this history, right? So this history of science 
not being used well um, and scientists not behaving well. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, here's a link and uh, maybe you could just uh, copy it or Google it. I know you can't hyperlink a video, um, but it's a really interesting article about mm, this thing, the ILSI. And this is quotes, I should have put these in quotes, but this is quotes from the New York Times. It's about the International Life Science Institute. Okay, what is this? Well, it's a, it seems like it's a science-y thing because it's in its, its, work, its name here, right? It should be science-y. Um, what it is, it's an American nonprofit. Um, ooh, it's been infiltrating government health and nutrition bodies around the world, according to this article. It's created by a Coca-Cola executive. Okay, what is Coca-Cola? It's a large corporation with food and agricultural interests. It's got branches in multiple countries. It's been fat, not, it, it was uh, created by this dude, but others as well, all biggies in the agribusiness, food, and pharmaceutical industries. Well, so, of course, these guys are gonna do stuff. What do they do? Well, um, they've done some bad things, in my opinion, and in the opinion of this, uh, the article's authors. It's methodically cultivated allies in academia and government sponsoring conferences and by recruiting influential scientists to committees that work on issues like food safety. What this means is that this, uh, so corporate people, powerful corporate people are using this institute to basically co-opt scientists and have them give them a conflict of interest where their research should be positive for the profits of the nonprofit or not the nonprofit but you know the Coca-Cola and the other Goliaths of agribusiness um, which uh, in, so they must be getting something from this they probably get money they get travel they get hotel rooms and it corrupts their research because then their research is no longer unbiased. Elsie runs a research foundation. And it, so you'd think that if they're doing research, it should be unbiased. But it's not because of the conflicts of interest here. Uh, focused on health and environmental issues, it's largely funded by the chemical industry. Is the chemical industry going to look well on a scientist who finds environmental issues with their chemicals, that's called a conflict of interest. The answer is no, and be, so there's a conflict of interest here. Um, it also has this uh, journal. Uh, it's an academic journal, Nutrition Reviews, which is cool. Go to Nutrition Reviews and start looking at um, the publications there and ask yourself, can I trust these publications? Um, where are they getting their money from? And um, are they unbiased in the the articles they publish are they unbiased and are, are the people who publish they're getting their money from um, companies that are not influencing their behavior all right so uh, read the article I'm not explaining it very well but if you look at it I think it's chilling um, what big money can do with science so I'm going to talk about science gone bad number one is where there's bias so first of all, there's gender bias, there's racial bias, there's religious bias in all aspects of science at all levels. And you know this. You know that it happens in grade school, it happens in middle school, it happens in high school, it happens at college, it, um, and it, just, it, it is throughout, has been throughout society. We keep trying to beat it back, but it keeps coming back. All right, so that's a problem because you would think that, that and getting at the truth would like objective truth uh, would be something anybody should be able to do and that not just one narrow group of humans should be able to do that for the benefit of everybody and yet um, women people of color different religions uh, uh, if you don't have got money if you're not from a rich background um, there's always been this bias uh, everywhere including in science I want to give you an example. Um, it, I, right here, interpretation of Neanderthals by human supremacists. I didn't say white supremacists here. I said human supremacists. And by that, I would, 
posit that we are all, to some degree, human supremacists. By that I mean we all think humans are better than all other species. It's obvious from our society we have rights. Uh, humans have certain rights, uh, including like you shouldn't be killed indiscriminately or um, be able to steal and so forth. Um, right to freedom of speech, religion, those things, which I know that many of us are denied those rights, but fundamentally, I think we all agree that we should have, we're humans, we should have those rights. But do we give those rights to dogs? Do we give those rights to worms? Do we give those rights to trees? No, we're human supremacists. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, in, in my experience, whoops, in my experience, of uh, the depiction of Neanderthals, which is another species that coexists with Homo sapiens not too long ago, is it's always like, they're a stupid, stupid things that look ugly. They're all hunched over and they look stupid and they do stupid things and they're just stupid. That's the impression I have always gotten from all depictions of Neanderthals. But we don't do that to giraffes. We don't do that to condors. But we picked out this one group that looks pretty darn hominid and we depict them in museums and in cartoons and in the literature and, and even in the scientific literature as being stupid, uh, not as good as us. So we're better than them. Well, <laughs> go look in the literature, at, uh, the most, more recent literature of Neanderthals and our understanding of what their society was like. We used to think they were stupid and had no tools and no art. And then it turns out that actually they buried each other with flowers. So that shows more than just dumb animal. Um, they did artwork. They were probably exterminated by Homo sapiens. So it's almost like the victor rewriting the history of the Neanderthals. I'm just saying, I believe that our depiction of Neanderthals is a classic example of bias in science. And if it's, if it's there with our most close relatives, the Neanderthals makes you wonder where else it is. Here's another example. Using mostly male subjects in tests of drugs used on both sexes. So aspirin, for instance. Let's uh, make sure aspirin uh, doesn't cause any negative health effects. So we're going to do this big, large-scale study. It turns out that 94% of our, our, our uh, people doing the study were males. Uh, and we hardly included any females at all. In the end, we conclude aspirin has this effect on humans. Uh, wait a minute. Don't you think that estrogen and testosterone might have some possible effect on how people respond to aspirin? How can you say it doesn't if you didn't uh, study that? And that's just uh, um, one example of implicit gender, built-in bias in uh, uh, scientific experiments. I'm sure you can think of many others. I just don't want to... 57 minutes. All right, hiring bias too. So not just doing the experiments, what about hiring people? So uh, just look at the composition of groups of scientists and make your own uh, uh, summary. You don't even have to. You can look at people who have done studies of, of the makeup of scientific community and see like, uh, there seems to be some inequity here. Okay, so there's definitely bias. There has been. I like to think it's getting better. I think it's getting better, not fast enough in my opinion or in anybody who is justice oriented in their opinion. All right, then there's intellectual bias, completely different from these kind of biases, gender, racial, and religious, intellectual biases. And it's like um, it, uh, a paradigm is a way of viewing the world. So at one point, for instance, we had this paradigm that the Earth's continents were pretty fixed. They just stay there. They're there. They've always been there. Um, they're always going to be there. They know do silly things like move around. Okay. I think you've probably heard of the theory of continental drift, and we all pretty much accept now that, yeah, over long periods of time, our continents drift, but it took a paradigm shift in geology to accept that, and it was huge. Now, what happens is the first person to propose an alternative view to that paradigm Usually they get shut down, they get mocked, they get ridiculed because 
they're basically saying you guys are so wrong and you've been wrong for a long time <coughs> you fools <coughs> probably they, they don't say it that way um but they get mocked the dude who first proposed continental drift ends up getting the hell out of geology because he's not welcome and he went into meteorology and ultimately i think he died in greenland somewhere as a meteorologist but anyway alfred wegener uh oh yeah there's the example uh, climate change is another one. Early days of climate change, I was a student here at Humboldt State University. No one was talking about climate change, but a few people were like, um, maybe greenhouse gases? Don't have much data, but maybe. Here we are 40 years later, like, uh, still haven't done much about it. All hope is not lost. All right, science gone bad number two, money and power. We're humans. Um, commonly commercial forces will exploit or misuse science to protect or promote themselves. So great examples, the tobacco industry. Another example, more modern, is the fossil fuel industry. Big money able to co-opt scientists, make bad science, but publish it as good science, muddies the waters, slows down reform, protects their bottom line. That is science gone bad. Not going to go into this. There's excellent um, uh, summaries of this out there in the media and in the literature. Uh, last comment, but it's not rare enough. Individual scientists unethically promote their own status by cheating, by making up data, doing also crazy stuff. Here's something you can do. Um, you can pay to have your uh, publications published. No peer review, easy peasy. What that does is that inflates the list of publications in your resume, and a lot of times nobody notices. So um, you can look up this article yourself and read up on it. It's crazy funny. Oh, I, uh, uh, boy. Uh, I'm getting almost done here, guys. Bear with me. This is really cool. Estimating the reproducibility of psychological science. Uh, this is getting, this is five years old now. Um, what it did is it reported some breaking news, I think uh, started in the social sciences because there were some, some papers that were sort of pivotal to developing certain theories of social science and psychology. We all believed them to be true. They were peer reviewed, they were great, um, they seemed good. And uh, they also, probably there's some confirmation bias that we all kind of liked what they said. And so that became sort of a bedrock for a lot of subsequent research. Well, some people went back and repeated the experiments in those, those uh, um, first studies. Now, I said that an experiment must be replicable, but I didn't say it must be replicated. So that a, very rarely is does someone run an experiment and then someone else does the same experiment. Why would they do that? They want to do new stuff. And so most experiments are never reproduced, even though they should be reproducible. So when these went, somebody went back and tried to reproduce the original study and they were unable to do it, it made everybody nervous because like, oh shit, what other super important publications that we've based so much work on are also not reproducible? And it's, it's, it started kind of revolution in the sciences, not just the social sciences and psychology, but elsewhere as well. Scientists are starting to do a, a little bit deeper look into reproducibility, and it should be interesting to see what happens. I'm almost done. This is the last part. My I, I saved my biggest for last, my biggest pet peeve for last, is that science can be you, an immoral use of an amoral process. By amoral, I mean it's a process without morality. It's not good or bad. It's just a process. It's a recipe. You don't have to follow it. You can use it for whatever you want. Science is a tool. A tool can be used for good stuff. A tool can be used for bad stuff. A crescent wrench is a tool. So is a nuclear bomb. Okay, Science is a tool. And the immoral use of science bugs the shit out of me because I like to think of myself as a moral person and a scientist and I don't like the idea of scientists helping bad guys. I'll just give you an example. This is a picture of a bristlecone pine. The bristlecone pines have the oldest trees in the world. 
the oldest organisms in the world. And once upon a time, there is a guy, I think he was a postdoc, and he was trying to find the oldest trees in the world. And he was using a device called a coring device. It takes a, th a straw-shaped piece of wood out, and you can count the rings without killing the tree. And he was trying to do this on all these trees, but he was having trouble with this one tree. It kept breaking his tool. And so he asked the Forest Service for permission to cut some trees down. And they said, sure. And so he did. He sectioned them. That's a quote in his, I looked up his paper. He said, some trees were sectioned using the passive voice and talking about sectioning the tree. He cut the trees down and he found the oldest tree in the world. He had killed it. I have a lot of problems with that. That's, I could, uh, I wish that person had not done that. I find that immoral. Uh, most people won't really give two hoots about trees too much, but killing off enormous numbers of people and possibly all the people on the planet, pretty sure that's immoral too. It was scientists who developed the nuclear bomb. Say what you want about World War II and the threat the United States was under, the development of nuclear bombs, I don't know, man. I don't know how you can call that as moral. Okay, that's my opinion. These are just two opinions. Uh, two examples of what I consider an immoral use of an amoral process. I hope that you can think, well, I hope you can't find any, but unfortunately they're far too easy to find, of um, many times where science has been used for immoral purposes. I'm pretty sure that Nazi Germany, the Nazis in Germany were using science and experimenting on people in immoral ways. Okay, so the point here is don't glorify science. Understand science. Understand how it works. Understand how powerful it is. Understand it's just a tool, a tool to be used, a potentially dangerous tool, a potentially wonderful tool. Okay, so yeah, that's really what I wanted you to get most of all out of this lecture is understanding what science is, having a realistic idea of what science is, of what scientists deal with, um, both when they're doing experiments and also in their professional lives. Okay, I'm not done. If you want science, um, an hour and seven minutes, even when science gets something right, it takes a long time for things to percolate throughout society. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys this PDF. Um, <sighs> okay, this is all about the ozone hole story. Mario Molina, thank you. Um, I'm just going to give you this as a PDF. There's a wonderful story here about how the ozone hole was formed how it was discovered initially, how its discovery was resisted by industry, how people woke up to a clear and present danger, how then policy slowly caught up with this and fixed it. It's not totally fixed yet, but it's getting there. It's a, it's a good story because it illustrates how things work and will work in other cases as well. So read through the story of the ozone, uh, discovery of the ozone hole. Remember that this whole thing took case, I think, in the, uh, took place in the 80s and 90s, and compare it to climate change. And I think uh, you'll find it instructive, and maybe we can discuss this more in lecture, because I don't want to go much longer in this video. Okay, given all the perils and failings of science, why should you trust it? Well, because you don't freaking throw babies out with bathwater. Ah, maybe you've never heard that idiom before. Throw the baby out. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I just added the freaking part. Uh, what that means is bathwater is ooey and yucky and bad, and you have a baby in it. The baby is clean and good. You want it get rid of everything just because you don't like the water you don't throw everything out including the baby right so in other words science can have some bad parts to it but it also has some good parts to it don't throw the whole thing out you should trust it because it's clearly a very powerful method that can be used for great good as well as great evil so it's the method you can trust it works pretty good how it's used 
That's another question. You, therefore, must learn to be a critical thinking consumer of scientific information. Okay, we're back to critical thinking. And you're a consumer of scientific information using critical thinking. That's our goal here in college as professors is to, for you students to do this, especially in science majors, even, um, well, in science classes like ESM 230. I know environmental studies people, uh, it's not a science major, but anyway, still, you're still beholden to this. Okay, and I'm, please, a moral practitioner of the scientific method. Don't be a tool for the man, guys. Okay, this is a wonderful lake, uh, Quilatoa, I think, in Ecuador. I was there once. It was so 12,000, 13,000 feet. Beautiful. Okay, thank you for bearing with us. We'll Zoom together soon, I hope. Bye-bye.